Hi, my name is Emma Hennessy. We're offering the TMB perspective on US foreign policy in the Ukraine war, and I'm our team's facilitator. Taylor Rosenblum will discuss our military support for Ukraine looking forward. Sydney Weatherford will address economic and political strategies, and Daria Lukinova, our regional and alliance expert, will speak on post-war alliances and Ukraine's continuing stability. I'm going to start by talking about our overarching goals and why we believe the United States has a responsibility and a vested interest in ensuring Ukraine's success in this war. It is essential for the US for Ukraine to win this war. Some advocate a policy of preemptive negotiation and have told you that prolonged American intervention is irrational, emotional, or guided by an unrealistic appraisal of the significance of this war to our country. The war in Ukraine, however, is of crucial significance to American security. The liberal world order, from which we've derived decades of peace and security, rests on basic international laws, norms, and institutions. Russia has severely breached each of these in invading Ukraine. It has breached the UN Charter. Preserving Ukraine's sovereignty is essential to upholding the way our international system works. It also sets a precedent, a precedent that the United States does not tolerate the armed invasion of sovereign countries and will advance a steady, committed effort against them. This is especially relevant in light of Chinese claims to Taiwan. If Russia earns itself Ukrainian territory as part of this invasion, other actors will be emboldened to launch similar attacks themselves. That possibility not only threatens the sovereignty of states across the world, it directly increases the likelihood of armed conflict in Asia, which would be a much more dangerous, more costly conflict than the one occurring in Europe today. Aiding Ukrainians now is an investment in our future security. It shows that the US is committed to defending the liberal world order and its allies and deters aggression against them. This war also offers us a chance to revive NATO and fortify our alliances with European democracies. These are some of our strongest allies, and NATO ensures security and peace across the European continent. Russia did not expect nor prepare for the extent to which the West has defended Ukraine. The joint effort by NATO members to support Ukraine has united us in a common cause and fortified our commitment to defend the liberal world order. NATO has become a better deterrent of further aggression in the future and will be better equipped to address it when and if it arises. These motivations to fight make for a clear picture of what our strategy aims to achieve. We intend to support the current counteroffensive vigorously and commit long term to the Ukrainian war effort. We have been pursuing the right path so far. We must continue. Ukrainians have far outperformed projections as they continue to defend their nation against a military three times the size of theirs. They cannot do this without continued support and this is not the time to stop giving it. Recent events help to show just how much the Russian, the Russian state battles domestic discontent and how impaired and divided its military really is. Wagner military group leader Yevgeny Prigozhin only last weekend threatened a military coup, and that he did with much popular support, as well as support from within the highest levels of the Russian state military. Though President Putin has averted that crisis, for now, it is clear that Russia is far from invulnerable. This is not the time to negotiate, Handing off Ukrainian land to appease a struggling would-be imperialist state in order to give it a way out from a disastrous war of its own making. This is a war of illegal territorial expansion, whatever mythical historical claims or security concerns the Russian state professes to have. We do not wish to weaken Russia, and we do not aim for regime change. We do, however, want to strengthen deterrence against Russian aggression and bolster Ukraine's ability to defend itself against it. Now I'll talk about the deal we should reasonably accept with Russia. I'll talk about each of these points briefly, but we'll go into each in depth later on. We recognize that though we are committed to Ukrainian war efforts in the long term, there are concessions we will make in order to prevent casualties and end fighting faster. The points on which negotiations are dependent, however, are these. That Ukraine be returned control of all land occupied since the invasion began in February of 2022 as well as the areas of the Donbas occupied in 2014. We will not tolerate Russia retaining any land taken by force as part of the 2022 invasion. We also plan to support Ukraine's admission to both NATO and the EU. That guarantees Ukraine security far into the future, defending the investment the US has already made in Ukraine security. To this end, we want to support an international effort to fund a reconstruction bill, which is integral to the country's continued stability and future defense. 
we are willing to accept a deal in which Crimea is under Russian occupation. Given the logistical difficulty of retaking the peninsula, stemming from its geography as well as the defenses Russia has been able to mount on it in its attempts to fortify the region since 2014, we believe that reclaiming Crimea is not feasible and that by leaving it under Russian control we might secure an earlier withdrawal from the Donbass. However, if the Ukrainian military is in a position to retake the peninsula, we will not prevent that maneuver. Our second concession will be the phased implementation of sanctions relief for Russia. A portion of sanctions will be lifted immediately upon the removal of Russian troops from the Donbass, while others will be lifted after longer periods, dependent on a lack of Russian aggression. I will now hand it over to Taylor Rosenblum, who's our expert on military matters. I am Taylor Rosenblum, and I will be advising on the types of military aid that the United States should increase in providing Ukraine with for however long this war lasts. As a committed partner backing Ukraine in this war, we should aim to provide Ukraine with the arms the country needs in the short, medium, and long term. All of these measures will be taken with the eventual goal of retaking all the territory in the Donbass, including that which had been occupied since the 2014 invasion. If it were to come to it, we are not willing to hold up negotiations because of sentiments over Crimea, but if Ukraine's position allows for a swift recapturing of the peninsula, the threat of Russian aggression is not imminent enough to prevent the U.S. from supporting the Ukrainian military maneuver. For the immediate future, Ukraine is in need of more ground-based air defense systems, which help defend the country against Russian drone and missile airstrikes. As seen on the graphic, since the start of the war through February of 2023, the United States has contributed eight National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems, or NASAMs, to Ukraine, costing roughly $285 million. The NASAMs have proven highly effective with an amazing success rate, strengthening the Ukrainians' defense, saving countless civilian lives from Russian attack, and thus, we should send over three additional systems, costing roughly $107 million. The NASAMs, along with a phased array tracking radar for intercept on target, or Patriot defense system battery, have both been delivered to Ukraine by the US, along with one being given jointly by Germany and the Netherlands. At $4 million per missile, and with each round requiring between five to eight missiles, we should provide Ukraine with an additional $48 million worth of missiles, or roughly two additional rounds of protection. The Ukrainian military is already trained and capable of using both these defense systems and can implement them into their country's defense upon delivery. Currently in progress is the training for armored vehicles, such as personnel carriers and tanks, which will be instrumental in Ukraine's fight for its territory. Troops are currently training in Germany to use and maintain the 31 M1 Abrams tanks we have given to Ukraine. These are deemed combat ready and the troops will be ready come the fall. These tanks are going to help significantly on the front line and once the troops are capable of using them, the Ukrainian military must be provided with more. To ensure that the West is aligned in its priorities, the US contribution of additional tanks and armored vehicles should be matched by a European contribution of a similar level of military assistance. Our additional M1 Abrams tank contribution should be contingent on Germany's cooperation in donating additional Leopard tanks, thus increasing Ukraine's military capabilities at a less of a direct cost to the United States. It is imperative that we work with our allies in Europe to partner in supporting Ukraine in its fight for democracy, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. Although deemed controversial, the United States should give the green light in providing Ukraine with F-16 fighter jets. Currently, Ukrainian fighter pilots are undergoing training on F-16s with our allies in Europe. As the sole manufacturing country of these fighter jets, countries cannot give F-16s to other countries without the United States approval. The countries likely donate to donate F-16s to Ukraine are Belgium, the Netherlands, and Denmark. Our approval for relocation of these aircraft is the only roadblock standing in the way of this deal. The U.S. should immediately approve of this relocation of F-16s, which would help the Ukrainians protect their airspace, as well as allow them to configure their Western defense systems to planes which they were designed to be mounted to, and thus they would function optimally. 
Ukraine can achieve this without the United States giving a single F-16 from its own stockpile, and so permission must be granted immediately to Belgium, the Netherlands, and Denmark. Although President Putin has stated that U.S. authorizing F-16s to Ukraine will be perceived as an escalatory measure by Russia, that is not a viable threat that the U.S., Ukraine, or NATO must be paralyzed by. The measures previously mentioned should all be contributed regardless of the strength of Ukraine's situation. However, they should all remain contingent on Ukraine using them to regain lost territory, and it will be deemed unacceptable for U.S. provided aim aid to be used to conduct attacks within Russia's borders. Throughout the entirety of this war, the Russian military has severely underperformed by all accounts, and due to the current internal conflict and lack of conscripts, the situation does not look like it will improve for them. Advocates of negotiation fear that if Russia finds itself in a desperate position, that President Putin would choose escalatory measures through the use of weapons of mass destruction. That is not a risk that should paralyze our policy as Russia's biggest ally, China, has outwardly claimed that if Russia were to implement any sort of WMDs, that it would directly disapprove of the actions causing further hardships for Russia, a risk that they could not afford to take. Another means of warfare Russia may attempt to employ would be a cyber attack on either Ukraine, NATO, or any NATO allies. Again, any attempts previously made by Russia have been weak and have been foiled by US, Ukrainian, or NATO cyber teams, and there is no doubt that future attempts at cyber attacks can be mitigated as well. Next, we will hear from Sydney Rutherford, who will inform you on the economic and political aspects of US support for Ukraine. I'm Sydney Rutherford, our economic and political expert, and I am discussing the economic and political proposals for supporting Ukraine and the implications of these actions. In order to accelerate U.S. support for Ukraine against Russia's attacks, it's critical to examine the effectiveness of the approaches we are currently implementing. We are assisting Ukraine economically and militarily, as well as attempting to deter Russia with sanctions that communicate to Russia and the world that violating international norms and aggressively invading a democratic country will be met with a vigorous coalition response. We additionally intend for sanctions to inhibit Russia's ability to continue the war by contracting their economy and hindering its ability to conduct international trade and financial transactions. The U.S. currently sanctions Russian oil and gas, assets, technology and military exports, and entities that support Russian war efforts. The effectiveness of these sanctions is contentious, with many arguing that broad sanctions often inflict economic turmoil on the middle class rather than those in power in the government. However, this may not be a flawed result as a financial, as financial instability is typically a major cause of civil unrest, which could force the country to halt its invasion. The recent Wagner uprising conveys that there are already domestic tensions in multiple levels of Russian society, which could speed up a Russian withdrawal from the Donbass. In addition, because wealthy individuals in Putin's circle are sanctioned, all, measure, all members of Russian society are affected. Sanctions have been largely effective and contributed to a sharp compression of Russian imports, forcing Russia's military and industries to source from more costly and inefficient suppliers. Russian industrial outpour also decreased for nine consecutive months after the war start, indicating the immediate effects of Western sanctions. The EU estimates that around 70% of, Russia, of the Russian banking system's assets are under sanctions, which will prevent their military from obtaining the necessary funds it needs to finance the war in, a, in the long term. Furthermore, 2023 projections forecast that Russia's economy will not recover to pre-war numbers due to budget deficits from G7's oil price cap and the EU's diversification away from Russian natural gas. This major decrease in oil revenue is apparent in the graph on this side. As you can see, the sharp decrease after the price cap was implemented. Because the sanctions have proved more than effective, we suggest continuing our current sanctions as well as implementing additional measures to pressure Russia's economy further. 
These measures include expanding targeted sanctions against Russian oligarchs and sanctioning Russian nuclear energy. The latter of these has not been yet implemented due to worries about our own reliance on their nuclear energy, but we believe that the benefits of decreasing Russia's revenue in this sector outweigh the personal risk to energy consumption. We also suggest that the U.S. engage in discussions with India to pressure Russia into continuing to sell oil at a potentially even lower price, which would continue to decrease Russia's ability to finance the war. Post-war, we propose that the asset and specific export sanctions be lifted after all Russian forces are removed from the Donbass, and a minimal lift of the oil price cap to be lifted after one year of no Russian aggression. The oil and gas sanctions should be completely removed after three years, and the tank targeted sanctions on individuals and military tools will never be lifted. We argue that the U.S. should increase its yearly aid to Ukraine to $80 billion from $76.8 billion last year in financial and humanitarian funds, as well as military tools. This increase is due to our proposed increase in military shipments, as well as the estimated cost of military training in the coming year. This amount also accounts for inflation and any immediate humanitarian needs that may arise. In terms of reconstruction aid after the war, Ukraine's need has grown, grown to $411 billion. We propose that the U.S. contribute $180 to $200 billion over a period of 10 years for the reconstruction efforts, which is approximately 50% of the total bill. This is consistent with past aid packages, as we contributed a little over half of the total aid to Ukraine in that graph on the left. Much of this aid will help modernize Ukrainian defenses so that it is less vulnerable to Russian aggression in the future, if that does arise, and can remain a stable, powerful ally into the future. Next, you'll hear from Daria Lukanova, our regional and alliance expert. I'm Daria Lukinova, and I will be addressing our regional and alliance goals. First and foremost, it is of utmost importance that Ukraine be admitted into both NATO and the EU. Ukraine's admission into NATO is not only heavily symbolic, but also essential to the stability of Europe and the world. Admitting Ukraine into NATO minimizes the threat that once the settlement is reached, Russia will reinvade Ukraine. The U.S. and its allies have dedicated billions of dollars to the Ukrainian war effort, and the future Russian invasion will render that existing investment moot. Security by membership in NATO is a better alternative than a unilateral American security guarantee as it provides the U.S. with more flexibility and shares responsibility among a wide array of members in future cases of Russian aggression. It is widely acknowledged that Russia has long loathed the prospect of Ukrainian membership in NATO. Those that argue against its admission emphasize the risks of potential Russian escalation. NATO membership, however, ensures far greater benefits than it poses risks. In light of the United Western response to its invasion of Ukraine and a struggling and divided Russian military, it is highly probable that President Putin would take lightly the prospect of instigating conflict with a NATO member. It is also vital for Ukraine to be admitted to the EU to show that Ukraine is symbolically culturally, and geographically a part of Europe. Admission to the EU denies Russia its goal of re-establishing a Soviet-era sphere of influence and paves the way for Eastern European nations to gain membership, increasing the unity of democracies on the continent. Furthermore, post-war Ukraine will need huge amounts of assistance in rebuilding its infrastructure and economy. Membership in the EU allows Ukraine to build a stronger economy through the benefits of import and export opportunities, better pricing on goods, and free trade. Looking forward to a post-war world, we recognize that the Russian state will remain a global actor and its interests must be weighed. We propose that the United States remain open to relations with Russia as long as it obeys the terms we have set out and abides by international law, but we do not aim to meddle with Russian internal politics. As we've stated, regime change is not our goal. Ukraine's sovereignty and future defense is. It is imperative that the U.S. offer continued support to Ukraine to, de to demonstrate our credibility to other nations. 
in the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, which had signatories from the US, Russia, UK, and Northern Ireland, each nation vowed to respect the independence and sovereignty of Ukraine and to refrain from the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of Ukraine, so long as it destroyed its nuclear weapons and became a non-nuclear state. Beginning in 2014 and continuing into February of 2022, Russia has clearly violated the Budapest Memorandum. Ukraine weakened itself with the understanding that Russia would respect its borders and that the United States and other signatories would defend them. If the U.S. begins to withdraw support from Ukraine, a message is sent that we tolerate and accept the violation of international law. This threatens our credibility and what the guarantee of U.S. protection means to our allies. The precedent that has been set by the memorandum applies not only to Ukraine, but to all our allies across the globe. This, all, this has a serious Im impact on global non-proliferation as well. Ukraine was one of the first countries to set the precedent of non-proliferation and vowed to be a non-nuclear state. Refraining from continued support to Ukraine might precipitate a, precipitate a domino effect of withdrawal from the non-proliferation treaty, which would be disastrous to non-proliferation efforts worldwide. The outcome of the war, war in Ukraine has widespread implications for the global community and American security far into the future. To wrap things up, I will now turn it back to Emma Hennessy, who will conclude our briefing. We've explained to you what is at stake. The stability of the liberal world order, the integrity of our basic international laws, and U.S. credibility. We have been doing what is right so far in providing military support to Ukraine, and we have been extremely successful. An invasion which was projected to last a number of days has lasted over a year and a half. Ukraine has managed to defend its territory against a much larger army, and Western democracies have united to provide the military support necessary for that ongoing effort. We need to continue providing aid until Ukraine reclaims its eastern provinces and reestablishes its territorial integrity. This means accelerated military aid, both in the immediate future and into the long term, that responds directly to Ukrainian needs. We will also continue to apply stringent sanctions to Russian individuals and businesses, and work to fund post-war reconstruction alongside our Western allies. We firmly advocate that Ukraine be admitted to both NATO and to the EU. This is an investment in the country's future security, and ensures its integration into the economic and political systems that have helped defend it to this point. The money we spend on Ukraine is an investment. It is a good one. Now is not the time to back out and appease the demands of an unstable, continually deteriorating Russian state. Russia's underwhelming military performance and status as an international pariah, whose economic survival depends largely on the allyship of China, have hobbled its ambitions. We do not believe it will use weapons of mass destruction when that will lead to their diplomatic isolation. The possibility that they may take up arms remains, but we have prepared for situations of escalation. Escalation is a reasonable concern, but not so much so as to paralyze our policy aims or to justify appeasement. We are confident in the ability of our policy to achieve and defend peace and security for NATO and America. We cannot launch into negotiations preemptively or before Ukraine has secured the military victories it needs to retain its eastern territory. This is going to take money and it is going to take time, but that is money and time well spent. We are not willing to let the international order fall and we are not going to let Ukraine fall. Thank you for your time and we'll open the floor to questions. So what happens if money and time are not enough? So if we think about the start of the war in February 2022, there are things that the Biden administration and others said they wouldn't provide. Um, so we've crossed a lot of our own red lines in terms of uh, escalating in terms of what we weapon systems and how much money and what we're willing to provide. We're now at the F-16 point. So let's imagine they get F-16s, get ATACMs, we're gonna give them F-35s, let's see. <laughs> like, it's not get there, but like, say we run out of indirect sources of aid. Um, and this whole time, the U Ukrainians are attriting non-trivial number of people, um, say they don't not only 
regain control of territory occupied since 2014, but don't manage to make much progress. What do we do? Do we just allow them to keep grinding till indefinitely as long as they're willing to fight? Are you talking about a different kind of escalation? What's plan B? So our plan continues far into the future, at least three years, um, into 2026, at least um, at least three other EU countries have made security guarantees three years into the future to keep providing um, aid to the Ukrainian war effort. We also believe that the U.S. should continue with that commitment. Um, we believe that it changes year by year. We change where the Ukrainian morale is. Our argument rests largely on the fact that Ukrainians are willing to fight and that they want to fight and that they're not going to accept a negotiation. Um, mostly here, we don't have that many options. Our options are preemptive negotiation or to keep fighting. Um, and there's no perfect solution. But compared to our alternatives, we keep fighting and we keep trudging on until we have success. We're not going to give it up. So here comes the other side of the question. Why would the Russians take this deal? It seems to me that if, we, if, the, if our only option is keep on keeping on, and there are places we're not going to go, like we're not, you're not saying we're going to start pr providing NATO manpower. Um, so far as I can tell, I may have missed something, but it looks to me like the only folk things you're offering the Russians are the offer of future reductions or removal of sanctions. And not and Crimea. Okay, yeah. So if that were enough for them, then arguably wouldn't be where we are already. Or and they wouldn't maybe have been invaded in the first place. Um, anyway, why, why, why do the Russians this deal? Is this predicated on the idea that they're, they too are getting work weaker and weaker and weaker and Putin's just going to say uh, what, what looked unacceptable yesterday and last week becomes more acceptable over time? Um, I mean, I, I would say our strategy is based on a military defeat. It's not about negotiating with the Russians until ha they're happy with the outcome. I mean, they're losing soldiers at a much higher rate proportional to the size of their army than the Ukrainians are. Well, we actually don't know what the Ukrainians are losing because they're not sharing them. I'm, again, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying we don't, act, as far as I can tell, we don't actually know uh, because we're not getting that data. Um, so we get a lot of happy stories, and I don't mean happy as in uplifting, but we're getting the stories we're supposed to get. But facts on the ground don't necessarily support some of these stories. And Zelensky and company are admitting that they're, they're losing troops and they're running short on ammo. Um, and so that it's not clear that this can be perpetuated indefinitely. Um, so military defeat is ambitious for them, but is it actionable? And if it's not actionable, convincing the Russians to buy in it's not a very palatable set of uh, options you put on the table. But Josh may be more um, optimistic about this, or you may have a, a good answer for me. No, I, I, I want to, I actually have the, a, a very different question, but I want to pursue this a little bit more, because I'm very troubled by this three-year commitment. Because what you've described, in answer to the question of what if this thing bogs down, your answer is keep pouring resources into a stalemate. I mean, this, this war is already a meat grinder, and you're talking about just continuing to invest in the meat grinder at enormous human cost. As long for as they're years. willing to let themselves be ground. Yeah, and, and uh, first, I, I just, I, I don't know if that's uh, a, a useful policy. I don't know that it, it leads to any kind of coherent theory of victory. Um, Russia's much bigger, it has many more people it can throw at the fight. So I, I, I don't understand the strategic logic of it, but if we get to the point where we've done this three-year investment in bloodshed, are you willing to put U.S. forces directly into the fight? We you, evaluate, we don't want to forecast that far. Now, I, I need an answer to this question, right? You've, you've cast your argument in terms of the future of the liberal order, the, 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 the global, uh, security, proliferation, basic liberal values on the line. Right? Shouldn't we be w willing to put U.S. forces into to, to this if it's bogged down, if Ukraine cannot win on its own? Right? Is, isn't that the logical implication of your argument? We're not entirely opposed to it. We've discussed it. We see maybe one day in the future, but I think it's irresponsible to project three years into the future when we have no idea. But we wouldn't say that it's absolutely a no. We're also 
waiting to see if Russia does resort to weapons of mass destruction. So if we don't think they were, they will. But everything depends on how time. What if goes. they resort to general mobilization instead of being the fighting this war in a half-assed way, the way they have so far? But I mean, what if they start throwing more men into women and mm -hmm. people into the meat grinder? Does anyone want to share? I don't want to take all the spotlight. I mean, I feel like Putin projected this war to last three days. Mm -hmm. He. I feel like if he were to, he has the opportunity to do so, and he hasn't yet, so what are the potentials that he will if he wanted this war to last three days? But we've seen it's gone for almost two years now. And I think also the question he on hasn't gone home either. <laughs> I'm sorry, Russian tell. general mobilization, mm -hmm. there would need to be a response to that, and that mm -hmm. can't go unanswered. Okay. Um, what that response would be would need to be figured out, but there would need to be some sort of, if Russia's going to escalate on their side to that point, then the countries backing Ukraine would have to escalate to meet that. There's your answer. Okay. <laughs> that's a whole new ball. Uh, yeah, it is a whole new ball. That's, 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 I'm glad you're being forthright about it, um, at least. I think you kind of danced around that, that, that question. Um, what about the opposite scenario? What about victory? Right? Let's, let's imagine that uh, Ukrainian forces achieve a breakthrough and are able to drive Russian forces out of Donbass because Russian conventional forces are tired or their morale collapses or their command and control collapses and they just flee en masse. Right? Well, what might happen then? Because I'm still looking at Donbass, and there's still a lot of um, angry Russians in Donbass, and 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 Russian sympathizers. It's a it's a decidedly pro-Russian part of the country, right? I, I've heard statistics that it's over 60% of the Donbass is actually Ukrainian leading. No, not not at all. Not in, not in terms Remember of those past happy voting stories records. <laughs> not at all. I, this is this is it's it's not a hundred percent either way, but it's majority a strong majority in favor of Russia, right, which is part of the reason why Russia was able to support an insurgency and effectively take control long before the invasion last uh, last February. So imagine Ukrainian army pushes all the way to the Russian border and now sits on Donbas. Right? Are we ready as Americans to support a counterinsurgency, which is going to happen? Are we ready to uh, 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 deal with a rebellion internally? Because I thought we were out of the counterinsurgency business. I thought we weren't going to fight those kinds of wars. But I look at this, and this has got all the recipes for a very nasty insurgency in eastern Ukraine. Are we willing to commit to, to fighting a counterinsurgency? I believe that if, you, if the Ukrainian... I don't know that much about the military aspects of you know, terrorist groups in eastern Ukraine. Um, but I would say that if the Ukrainian military has succeeded in fending off the Russian military, even though they haven't entirely generally mobilized, I would see them as more than capable than fighting an insurgency. I don't know. We, we pretty handily took care of the Iraqi army and the Afghan military, and we were stuck with decades of fighting rebellion. It's quite hard to do. It it is a very different analogy, given that we're across an ocean from the Middle East, and Ukrainian it would be the Ukrainian military in its own homeland. I have one more yeah, catastrophic yeah. victory question. Uh, go, go, go ahead, because I'm um, having now gotten the, the punchline on the table. Um, I have to reformulate how I'm Formulate the setup. Up. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, well, what happens to Crimea in this, in this future? Crimea, which is still under Russian control, but is no longer has a contiguous border with Russia. Crimea essentially becomes a Russian island surrounded by hostile forces. It becomes something like Kaliningrad or Berlin in the Cold War or Danzig in the interwar period. How do we intend to manage this? How do we deal with Crimea that it's not this forever sort of festering source of conflict between the US, Ukraine, and Russia? I mean, I'll start it off and then I'll pass it on to Taylor. Um, 
But I, I don't see it as a huge source of conflict. I think that the United States, like, we made it clear that we're not officially giving over Crimea, like handing its sovereignty over to Russia. We would just not push in militarily and not support the Ukrainian use of the army to go in militarily to Crimea. That's not one of our aims. Um, but I don't see the U.S. having a vested interest in what happens to Crimea once the war is over. But they're also going to be NATO. They're going to be a NATO member, and they're going to be an EU member. So they're going to have a vested interest in what happens to Crimea. I mean, they're I going to uh, un unavoidably. I could see like us not like not officially. Um, deciding that Crimea is Ukrainian territory, having it kind of ambiguous. I mean, I think that the more important part is definitely the majority of Ukraine. Actually, uh, doesn't NATO say no country can be admitted if it has unsettled territorial or border issues? Of, but the EU has all sorts of rules that, of, of course, they've said, a, you know, they only, we have these EU criteria, both only uh, apply some of them. <laughs> but okay. so. I'm not saying we should be that cynical about no, it, but right, uh, right. selectively we apply these criteria and we want to and don't do it. Um, I have two domestic politics questions that are about two different domestic policies. Number one, have you thought when you're thinking, Taylor, as Taylor mentioned, you guys talked about possibly uh, making this a NATO fight, have you, did you think about the potential domestic implications for um, the NATO member states and their populaces, because uh, I think they wouldn't all necessarily be on board with this. Um, and principally, there are also many cases we'd be talking about the US, because um, even many European NATO member states think that push comes to shove, the people who are fighting any war would be us, and <laughs> they would provide logistical support. So, what, what's your domestic, what's your answer to the question about domestic political potential pushback on the U.S. side? And let's imagine that you're right and Ukraine triumphs militarily and takes back all its territory uh, and the Russians have to bite down hard and accept this outcome. Everybody who I know who studies Russia, and I'm not saying this like if you know why, more, more like theories tell us. Putin's longevity as leader of the country, or maybe even the stability of the regime based on the 1917s, it will be, there will be unrest. Um, so maybe he'd be unseated in a palace coup and uh, there'd be a successor to Putin, maybe, but it might also be, turn out to be a very, very interesting time in Russian domestic politics next door to a new NATO member state, and we're talking about domestic unrest in the country that has more strategic warheads than any other country on the planet, in addition to some potential other complications. So have you thought about <laughs> what you, this scenario might do in terms of creating an interesting political environment in the defeated country? Yes, yeah, we have. We've thought about what happens internally in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, we would mostly want to take a hands-off policy, like we said. Um, we don't want for we don't want regime change. We're not going to work towards that. But if, let's say a civil war breaks out, then what? Well, if so, if Ukraine's in NATO, then they have the guarantee, and um, NATO has capability to maybe station some tactical nu nuclear weapons within Ukraine as a deterrence, uh, like as deterrence against Russian use. Um, and then to go back onto your domestic question, I kind of see it in three different parts. The first part being the NATO country, the Eastern European NATO countries would be more for it because um, like in their mind, it could have been them in a previous time. Whereas domestically in the US, we are part of this alliance that we give a lot to and get from. Mm -hmm. So. Unfortunately, that sometimes means like we need to contribute. Like that means we need to contribute and do our part. So we need to risk World War, World War Three to protect our non-ally, who's now become our ally. Mm -hmm. Yes, is that that's exactly what you're saying. Because like, that's basically where you're going. I would, I would just think um, that sounds like it's a. I know that there are a lot of references to World War III and the use of WMDs here. No, no, forget. Let, let's, let's imagine this stays conventional, just in that, you know, the okay. fantasy world. <laughs> this is still... 
I mean, I think a, a World War III scenario is kind of almost inflammatory sounding compared to, like I, I don't see the progression of how we're getting to that based on no use of nukes. If we bring NATO manpower, we're essentially saying we are officially, we're not simply supporting the defense of this country, we are actively becoming a belligerent in this conflict. Right. That is a real game changer. And that, you know, it is arguably, maybe heroic, maybe not heroic, that it could stay conventional, but that is a game changer. So you have this two dozen plus military alliance going to war against Russia. Right. That is, world, well, maybe and if nobody joins Russia, then it's not World War III, then it's NATO <laughs> against Russia. But, I mean, that's the point of NATO is to protect against Russian aggression. So if we're not going is to... Is it? Okay. Because uh, we go, we've gone to a lot, a lot of trouble in the post-World War, I mean, excuse me, post-Cold War period to say that's exactly what it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of consensus. That of it's course. I, I know. I'm giving you a hard time. <laughs> but this isn't about Russia. Josh, I know you have something. I, I, I'm lobbing a lot of grenades here, and you're being really quiet. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I'm trying to think more on this theory of victory. Okay. That, that it, it's not, what you're proposing is not simply brute force, because you do envision a political settlement. You, you, you say that at some point, push Russian forces out the Donbass, <coughs> but make a deal in which Russia gets to keep Crimea, even though we don't formally recognize it as a maybe, Russian entity. Maybe but they can keep it uh, because <coughs> we don't want to deal with that uh, a war on, on, on Crimea. Um, you also talk a lot about how continued fighting will destabilize Russia in useful ways. Right? Well, you talked about the recent events over the weekend, and the fact that there's internal strife and even authoritarians need to retain some public support for uh, their efforts, and the public support is going away. Um, and at the same time, you say your theory of victory is not regime change. I don't believe it. And neither will Putin. And neither will Vladimir Putin. Which is right? This, this idea that we are cheerleading internal fighting factional uprisings, mutinies, while publicly saying, oh, well, we don't want regime change. In the same way that NATO's not about, I, it's not against It's not that we don't want regime change, it's that we're not going to try and make active steps towards it. We want, we want to make steps that create dissension to, so that the, um, the administration wants to pull out of Ukraine, where they feel like it's such a burden that they, domestically they can't handle it and still stay in power. Ah, I see. So we are, we are flirting with regime change, even though we're not for regime change. Isn't this a recipe for escalation? I agree with you. But escalation, a lot of things would have to come together for, for, for any country to consider it. That's a big decision. It's but gosh, kind regime of change is kind of the thing that might compel somebody to gamble. Right? If your future is on the line, if that regime falls, Vladimir Putin is probably executed. Right? Probably executed, if not imprisoned for life. So, uh, aren't we playing a little fast and loose with escalation risks here by, by not only pushing Russia out of Donbass, but, but fomenting the kind of trouble that might give him those existential fears? But I mean, by, by fomenting, our main, our main way of fomenting is sanctions, which we want to lift after the war. Really, we don't have any other means of actually going into Russia and causing people to be angry at Vladimir Putin. Sure we do. The US has a long history of this sort of business. In our policy. In this one. So you're not recommending any support for future Prigozhin's? No. Okay. It's very Goldilocks. Just enough, but not too much. Mm -hmm. Isn't what you're proposing, even if I were to leave aside all of the pretty horrific risks we just heard about at a different level, I mean, let's say it is 2026 now. Are you confident that the coalition is not going to have grown theory of this war and that mm -hmm. the American people 
are not going to be looking for a settlement before that time? I mean, is it going to be that simple to maintain that level of political support for the sort of policy you're proposing? I mean, I think it's important to begin by saying it's always been a American goal to uh, get Russian power to diminish. While that's not actually what we're pursuing, it's a byproduct of our policy is Russian power. And throughout the war, Russian, per, the perception of Russia in the wo global world order has greatly diminished. And to this point, we haven't risked any American lives. We've risked Ukrainian lives for this. And I think it's important to note that we sh have to keep supporting Ukraine because in, in essence, they've been doing us a favor by fighting a war. And you could argue we've been doing them a solid as well. Well, yeah, we have. But, and I yeah, think that, that's how it needs to continue. So, but I mean, if we think about escalation, internal chaos in Russia, the sorts of risks that we just heard from Professor Greenhill and Professor Rovner, I mean, doesn't a political settlement look pretty good, particularly if you take the position that this war has shown that Russia is not the major military threat that many people thought it was prior to the war and that the real concern should be in the Asia Pacific and that's what should be getting the bulk of American resources? I feel like our policy begins to set the precedent for the Asia Pacific issue and if we continue to offer support to Ukraine and continue showing our demonstrated interest in we don't want these great powers to infiltrate on the security of smaller nations. Even if we're still pouring resources in in three years? I, I feel like it sets the precedent for China, especially given our policy if we admit Ukraine to like EU and NATO. It sets the precedent that, uh, that America does not stand by countries invading sovereign nations. It probably makes China happy because it keeps the, uh, our attention on Europe and not on them. And we're expending a lot of treasure um, not paying attention to China. I mean, it, it is 0.37 percent of our uh, GDP. That's obviously a huge amount, but it's not like we only have one general who can only pay attention in one sphere. We have a, a huge amount of commitments around the entire globe. Having a commitment in Ukraine, especially if we're going with the theory that Russia isn't as strong as the powers we previously believed, it allows us to widen our reach. Long wars, work. Long yeah. wars are really corrosive after a certain amount of time, even if there's a money left in percentage of GDP. We've seen this happen in Vietnam. You know, we've seen this happen more recently in Afghanistan. And you know, why it wouldn't happen in this And if you've been paying attention, presumably you have, to the battles over getting the debt ceiling you know, lifted, how much money do they actually have to play with that isn't already accounted for? It's paying interest and paying, you know, you could print more, but then you know, this is a... Uh, <laughs> We have to agree to print more, and this is more of a burden for you and your children and everybody thereafter to pay these bills. And uh, to, to, to say it's not really a commitment and to do it indefinitely, it's, it's not nothing, um, even if it doesn't escalate. So I have a question. Let's, let's imagine we get three years down the road, and it's still basically a stalemate. And, and for me, the worst fear is, is this just becomes a European version of Afghanistan, where this can go on mm -hmm. for you know, upwards of 20 years. So I have a, a kind of uh, bad choice either way. Now, you guys ha have a, a little Except bit Except we had troops in there. What? We had troops in there. So, so like, is it, do we have, we, do we have skin in the game or do we not have skin in the game in this scenario? I'm not trying to give you a hard time, I'm just trying to think about the analogy. Let's imagine somehow we still don't have troops okay. in the game. Okay, all right. But, but, so here's my question to you. you. You've reached a point really where uh, it's clear U.S. and, and European support is, is wavering. The, the losses for Ukraine are, are just getting even more horrific. The economy is still terrible. And uh, now you really have to think about going beyond the deal you've already proposed. And, and the question I've always had is, what's more important? It, let's imagine we could sit across the table from Putin and say, look, you can have one or two things. You can have the Donbass and Crimea. but..." Uh, Ukraine's going to become a NATO, a member of NATO, you know, next year, and EU membership and everything. So you have to swallow one of it, or um, you can uh, give us back all the territory, Crimea, Donbass, and we will, you know, we're, without saying it, we're we're not going to push NATO membership, or maybe we'll go even further. We'll we'll get Ukraine to accept a neutrality deal. Um, my question, I guess, to you guys is: is which one of those would you accept? 
you had to. Again, you don't want to, but uh, is it more important to get Ukraine into NATO and EU for the future and give up the territory or get the territory back and not become a member of NATO and EU? If you had to, to think about one of those two. And I know you don't want to think about either one of those two. So we think that it would be more important for Ukraine to get NATO and EU membership and give up on some of the territory because the other way around just puts them back to where they were in 94 with the Budapest Memorandum. And so a little, so less territory with the promise and security guarantees that come with NATO and the economical aid that comes with the EU. It's interesting. I actually think I think Ukraine would accept that rather than so I would agree with you, but these are all kind of fantastic scenarios. Uh, I'll turn. Um, I think we have to move to the uh, teams. We, we do. Ask each Absolutely. other questions. So, yeah, you guys ask a lot of questions. Hey, uh, while they're formulating their questions, I also want to say uh, a lot of thanks to Keith for preserving the document. Um, about why you don't think escalation is something that could happen. So you said if Russia uses WMDs, it will lose support from the global community. Is this do you think a significant enough deterrent, and are you willing to take this risk? Um, why do you think Putin should care about his international rep reputation if he perceives I, I, if he perceives a threat to Russian sovereignty? What's the second part of your question? Are you willing to take this risk? Oh yes, and yes. I mean, we we <laughs> we, we said. That was pretty much the, the slide, um, not to do the whole, we, we said this already, but um, yeah, it's, it's a risk. We believe that a manageable risk. We believe that the benefits of taking the risk are much higher than the probability of the risk actually occurring. Um, and China has publicly stated that if they use WMDs, they're, using, they're losing Chinese support, and most of their oil is bought by China. So we see that as highly factoring into it. <laughs> if Putin thinks he's going to get put in jail tomorrow, why does he care if China is buying Russian oil? He would use his nukes. What? If Putin <laughs> thinks Russia is going to lose, why, why does he care what China thinks? The I, Putin's are... I don't think we're under the illusion that Putin thinks he's going to lose yet. But you're... This is in the escalation scenario. Yeah, you're you're proposing that Ukrainian troops go into the Donbas and 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 fight Russia back to the lines that it was existing before 2014. Right. Why why is Russia's position in the international community so important that Putin would be willing to risk, like we said, like regime change, Russian sovereignty, for Chinese oil? I mean, for for China to buy Russian oil, it. Those don't seem like an effective deterrent. Well, it's more so. It's more than just Russian oil at this point. Um, China's support, like supporting or the biggest supporter of Russia's economy, and without the economy even functioning at the fraction of a price that it currently is, there's no support and no money going into this war effort. So you have to maintain whatever line of like credit you can get at that point. I mean, we're talking about complete diplomatic isolation and pride, and except for like tiny countries like that, ha that haven't really taken a huge global stand. I mean, I think it's pretty evident, that, I mean, this is why countries don't use nukes except ever, I, except in extremely rare scenarios. Our question? Yeah, you guys have your question. Okay. So for your guys' deal to pass, you would obviously have to seriously pressure Ukraine. It would be really hard to get them to accept this at all. So what do you expect to happen to U.S. credibility in its weight in working with allies, making deals, signing international law, 
given that fact. Um, and especially, we'd like you to talk about what you think this means for the Budapest Memorandum and the precedent of non-proliferation as a concept on the globe, which was set by Ukrainians in 1994 and was dependent on the promise of U.S. protection. We think that with our political settlement, this is a risk we'd be willing to take to avoid escalation and to preserve peace, or to again, create peace in Europe. Um, we think that we, we do, you know, admit that this doesn't set the best uh, set, uh, precedent uh, for other countries, but we think that it's a risk worth taking, especially if we're going to see, you know, because our whole group is about avoiding escalation. We'd rather avoid escalation than set a bad precedent in the future. Also, we think that this war is going to end in negotiations one way or another. Most wars end in some kind of negotiation, and we think that after this counteroffensive is the best time to negotiate to ensure something that is beneficial for Ukraine. So why partial appeasement instead of complete appeasement? Like, why not just allow Russia everything they want? What, like, where do you draw the line between, like, how do you decide what territory to give and what not? Are you saying why not? I mean, I'm saying, where do you draw your line? Like, how did you determine just how much to appease them with? We talked about kind of the stalemate reaching a natural conclusion, drawing the lines where that lies. Both countries will have different perspective once they realize that they're not making territorial advancements. And on the question of EU and NATO, we looked at the benefits that Ukraine would get from NATO and saw other ways that we could give them that security and those trade incentives without the provocative nature of putting them in NATO. So, I mean, it's a settlement. We're trying to get a piece. Okay. Over there. Um, I just want to say I thought this was really terrific. I think you all did fantastic work. But first, I want to thank our experts, Professor Greenhill and Professor Rogner, for their excellent questions and for being here today. So. Say, as a teacher, this is kind of what the four of us live for. This was really great to see all of your all of your efforts today and see how it paid off and see how you handled some some really tough questions today. So I think we all you all you a round of applause as well. Um, so that's it. Thank you all again. And Galen, can I just say a word? That was really excellent. Yes, you guys were amazing. Like, for not faint praise, these are hard questions. And obviously you can make strong arguments on either side, but these were really, really well-constructed briefs and, and, and dealing with really hard questions from Kelly. And it was quite... <laughs> you threw softball all day. Was, no, 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 but, but, but for real. This is, a, clearly, you've been at this for three weeks? I mean, that is really, really well done. It, it truly is, um, and as your professors can tell you, we're not just saying this in front of you. We yeah. comment, we said the same thing when you weren't present over lunch. Yeah. Um, so kudos. Yeah, well, well. Great job. Excellent. Well, thanks again. Really enjoyed it. All right.